Hello, Dazzle. Thanks for coming and hanging out with me today. I am glad that you are here. Today, I am going to be talking uh, uh, more about poop. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking more about constipation. In the first part, I talked about what constipation is and why it's important to prevent it or to treat it when prevention is unsuccessful. In the second part, I want to talk about chronic constipation. So chronic constipation is different than occasional or reoccurrent constipation. It is considered normal for a person to occasionally experience episodes of constipation, and these occasional episodes are not associated with the previously discussed health risks. Uh, recurrent constipation is when you have short bouts of constipation that become a pattern over time. Uh, this is more common in conditions like irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. Uh, chronic constipation is when you present with consistent symptoms of constipation for a duration of six months or more. Uh, chronic constipation is common, affecting about 15% of the population, having a mental health diagnosis, being older than age 65, being female, and living in a care facility are factors strongly associated with chronic constipation. Those who are experienced chronic constipation are more likely to report symptoms of having a difficult time passing stool or an inability to completely empty the bowel rather than a reduced frequency of stool. Uh, when looking at quality of life indicators, having chronic constipation has scored comparable with patients suffering from asthma or rheumatoid arthritis. So this diagnosis not only carries increased risk for adverse health outcomes, it also carries the very real risk of having significant impact on a person's daily life. Uh, there are three types of chronic constipation, which include normal transit constipation, slow transit constipation, and defecation disorder. It is possible for a person to have defecation disorder in addition to slow transit constipation. The symptoms of constipation are the same for all three types of constipation. Uh, despite half of all the chronic constipation cases are normal transit constipation. In these cases, diagnostic testing shows no abnormalities in the gut motility or the way that stuff moves through the gut. In 15% of cases, diagnostic testing shows decreased motility and is given the diagnosis of slow transit constipation. Gastroparesis is a common comorbidity of this type of constipation, which is not surprising since both conditions um, are about decreased mo motility. 25% of chronic constipation is caused by defecation disorders, and the remaining 10% are those who have both a defecation disorder and slow transit constipation. Uh, defecation disorders are a group of disorders that describe conditions that cause a person to have an impaired ability to pass stool from the rectum out the anus. There are numerous diagnoses beneath this umbrella, which include pelvic floor dysfunction, anatomical abnormalities such as prolapse or rectocele, uh, neurogenic bowel, which is nerve damage, and others. Uh, it's worth mentioning the irritable bowel syndrome with constipation or IBSC, uh, since it's a type of chronic constipation. However, it doesn't fall under the umbrella of the chronic constipation diagnosis, which is also called functional constipation, as it is classified as being a type of irritable bowel syndrome. Having IBSC precludes the diagnosis of having either normal or slow transit constipation, but it doesn't preclude the possibility of being diagnosed with a defecation disorder. The diagnostic distinction between IBSC and normal transit or slow transit constipation is that IBSC has regular bouts of loose stools that are not associated with the use of laxatives. So hopefully the preceding discussion has made it clear that the diagnostics of having constipation is complex and nuanced. Uh, because of this complexity, it often requires extensive testing to determine the type of constipation that a person is experiencing. Since the type of constipation will determine the best treatment approaches, it's important to determine the type of constipation that a person is experiencing. This testing often uh, includes x-rays, lab work, CT scans, MRI, colon colonoscopy, colorectal transit studies, defconography, anal rectal management. Um, however, these tests are not always performed. 
If you've been receiving treatment for constipation without relief for several months without this kind of workup, I would recommend advocating for this differential diagnosis. Getting a second opinion might become necessary. And it is important to have a gastroenterologist evaluate your case since they're the specialist regarding the gut. Keeping a medical journal is very valuable. If you're suffering chronic constipation, but you're not having effective treatment or you don't know which type of constipation you have, I would strongly recommend that you start a medical journal. Include a daily record of every bowel movement that you have. Document the type of stool you pass by the Bristol Stool Scale Rating System. Also document any symptoms that you have when passing those stools, such as pain, bleeding, nausea, cramping, etc. It's also useful to document what you eat and drink every day. This information can help you and your provider find patterns or trends in your bowel habits. So having type 1 or type 2 stools per the Bristol stool scale is highly indicative of slow transit constipation, while normal transit constipation generally has type 3 or type 4 stools. Uh, needing to use manual maneuvers, such as using the fingers to remove stool from the rectum or applying pressure to the lower abdomen, is highly indicative of a defecation disorder. Having bouts of loose stools uh, not associated with the use of laxatives is considered to be IBSC. Abdominal pain while having a bowel movement that is better after the stool is evacuated is also indicative of IBSC. Rectal pain is more likely functional constipation rather than IBS, but this is not as clear a distinction statistically. Um, having frequently varying types of stools per the Bristol stool scale is indicative of IBSC. And these kinds of trends are best noted when a person is keeping a medical journal of their stools. Um, including your food and fluid intake as part of your journal can be helpful for both the diagnostic process and the treatment phase. If you only have loose stools after you have eaten a particular food, it becomes less likely that it is IBSC and more likely that you have constipation and food allergy or food intolerance. When you begin the treatment phase of your constipation, having a dietitian or a nutrition review your food log could be helpful in considering ways that you can modify your diet to help prevent constipation. So that's about it for my rambling today about poop, but don't worry, I will be talking more about poop in my next video. Thanks for coming and spending time with me. If you like what you re uh, you're <laughs> seeing, click on the like button. It really does help. And until we talk again, you guys be sure to take care of yourselves. Bye!